Welcome back. We are pursuing a study in Second Commandment theology for loving your neighbor as yourself. In our study, we are currently examining the, the armor of God, and we have worked our way up to the hope of salvation. Now, the hope of salvation supports the troubled suffering of a believing sinner. Now, the hope of salvation, we're, we're on the helmet. Let me make sure I'm clear on that. We're on the helmet. Perseverance and patience are the shoulders on which a believer carries his or her burdens, failures, trespasses, troubles, and weariness. There are those who resign themselves to suffering in silence, which is a form of desperation and despair. However, if despair were a cure for trouble, those wounded in their spirit then could relax. I mean, that makes sense. But obviously it is not a, a solution. So now, on the other hand, there are those who resort to counterfeit perseverance and patience. And that counterfeit perseverance is alcohol or substance abuse. The goal of substance abuse and alcohol is to temporarily anesthetize one's mind and feelings so that one can forget about or ignore his or her troubles. However, when the anesthesia of the alcohol or the substance wears off, one's troubles are still there. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We continually remember before our God and Father, your faith produced by your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> endurance or patience or perseverance inspired by hope is a reality check, a sobering grace which is a barometer of one's hope, which is a measure of the soundness of one's mind. Now, let's talk about that a little bit more. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, a sound mind means to bring one back to his or her senses, which implies that when overwhelmed by one's troubles, one could be entangled in a measure of insanity, meaning you're out of your mind. So, using a nautical example, healthy hope now floats on a sea of trouble. Then I say again, the trouble is still there, but hope floats on it. However, if the hull of hope I'm looking at a ship now, loses its integrity and cracks or springs a leak, the surrounding trouble floods in to the mind, will, and emotions. Then one will begin to sink into an insanity of confusion, despair, fear, or ignorance until prayer sounds the trouble alarm and faith's report shores up hope to stop the leak. And by the filling of the Spirit, the pumps of grace, mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation cleanses the conscience and restores the soul. Psalm 69 verse 1 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Now, the psalmist identified his problem that led to the solution. Now, he's got this, he's got a lot of trouble here, but the solution is kind of hinted at in verse five, where it says, you know my folly, O God, my guilt is not hidden from you. Now, what happened was his guilt convicted him and caused him to seek God's grace and mercy. That's the solution, God's grace and mercy. In the last lesson, I asserted that hope defends the believing sinner against suffering 
but does not stop suffering from happening. Again, Proverbs 18, 14 says, a man's spirit sustains him or her in sickness, but a wounded or crushed spirit who can bear. This verse now describes hopelessness, uselessness, and worthlessness, which are components of suicidal ideation as a crushed or wounded spirit. A crushed, wounded spirit is one's reaction now to an acute or chronic suffering, a reaction that overwhelms one's resolve and resilience from which one sees no resolution or no hope. That's why they become useless, worthless, and hopeless. But hope now, if hope can be revived, it revives a crushed, disturbed, troubled, and wounded spirit when nothing else can. However, waiting on God to do it is one of the enemy's primary points of attack, and I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. Psalm 62 verse 1 says, For God alone my soul waits. In silence from him comes my salvation. Deliverance in suffering is closely closely linked to holy silence. I'm slowing down a little bit. However, it is while one is waiting that the enemy seeks to violate one's conscience by planting confusion, doubt, fear, and misinformation. We went through the things, the, the, the darts of the enemy. As the enemy presses his attack, Hope brings consolation to a suffering soul who can smile even with tears running down one's face. This is called rejoicing in hope. Hebrews 3, 6 says, But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and are rejoicing in hope. And Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope, there it is again, of the glory of God. Now, glorying in God is a rejoicing which the believing sinner cannot contain within himself or herself. So, while the enemy attacks by violating one's conscience, the promise of God's truth reduces and reverses the impact. That's if we have hope in it. Come on here. Romans 5, 5 says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Faith and hope now are two graces which Christ uses above others to restore a suffering soul. Faith is the substance and evidence of hope, and hope is the expectation of faith's promise. The gospel is source for both. (laughs) That's the foundation right there, the the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it is delusional for one to have confidence in the flesh because of the fickleness and instability of one's heart and the inconsistency of one's mind. The grace, mercy, and peace of God is a limitless source, and hope now taps into that source as a praying grace that can wait on God, looking beyond God's delay. Now I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about God's a little bit more in just a few minutes. By trusting God's promise, one can discern God's will and find contentment in all circumstances. Luke twenty one. 28 says, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your head 
for your redemption is near. Now, ironically, hope is an ointment that heals from a distance. Now think about this. A believing sinner's hope is linked to heaven. We're talking about salvation. Yet it heals all wounds one receives on earth, or, or what or the ones we receive in this body. Hope is God's message that speaks to the believing sinner who, like Paul, realizes he or she will not outlive his or her earthly suffering. But in his or her suffering now, we learn the sufficiency of God. That's what Paul did. God's grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, one who loves the world rejects God's admonishment. Guess what? Not to love the world or the things of the world. However, gaining the world but losing one's soul is a high price for a tainted temporary triumph because life is temporary. Life on, in this world is temporary. Now, there are those who say that God is blessing someone when he or she lives in the sunshine of prosperity and is condemned, and God is condemning one when he or she are caught in the storms of adversity. Now think about that. But hope now, true hope, can count it all joy while one faces any trial. Hope assures the believing sinner that even though God has allowed suffering, it is not for his or her harm, but for the good. Come on here now. God can turn, God can do that. I asserted earlier that perseverance and patience are two shoulders to bear one's present evil and to wait for the future promise not yet realized. Where there, but now think about this. Where there is no hope, there is no strength. However, Isaiah 41, 40, 31 says, those who hope in the Lord, or in your version, it might say those who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. <clears throat> Ironically, God, for his own reasons, wants his children to wait for his promise. Come on here. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it lingers, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. So, how does one reconcile this wait and not waiting? Uh, now that, 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 that's an interesting point. How do you reconcile that? So, consider this. God has made a unilateral covenant promise, but with a mysterious character. Now think about this. And what's the problem? Because we cannot understand God's chronology, we think he must have forgotten. There's scripture that deals with this. We literally, but now here's what we do in our own humanity. We literally give God a time limit. We seek comfort and expect the promise to keep time with our impatient desires. However, will the sun move any faster if we set our watch forward? Now, we do daylight saving time to go back and forth, but, will that, but the sun moves at the same pace. So, neither will the promise come sooner because we claim it. Now, think about this. God could tell us when he will perform his promise. But instead, he conceals it to build our faith so that we may learn to trust him confident that he will act when the time is right. 
He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there on time. That's something that is quoted in almost every church I've ever been in. However, real trust is resting satisfied with the promise when the time of fulfillment is unknown. Think about that. All right? So, but now let let, let me shift gears a little bit. To hope without a promise is to claim a debt that was never owed. Now, that's not the believer's issue. Believers have promises for subduing sin and Satan, but these enemies still have residence within us. Come on here. Spiritual warfare is about the scuffles and struggles with the enemy and one's sinful, our own sinful nature. Remember, we have a split personality disorder. Now, think about this. There are times when a believing sinner, an heir to all of the benefits of heaven, can barely show a penny of this heavenly treasure. Now, as I stated earlier, this is when the enemy's assault is the strongest. The enemy, using a similar gambit that he used with Adam and Eve suggests that God's delay means that he is not going to fulfill his promise, not going to answer your prayers, has failed to intervene for you, and is allowing you to be defeated by your lust and exposure to calamity. He failed to send his comforting grace in time, and now you are in the belly of hell. Now, can, now, if you're honest, you probably had feelings like this one time. But now, all of these promptings could be resisted if one remembers one thing. God is faithful. And no matter how it looks, God's faithful. Hope groans, but does not grumble when promised mercy is delayed. The groans of hope, I want to say hope now, the groans of hope come from the Spirit of God or the Spirit to God. Think about this. The Holy Spirit to God in prayer. The Spirit speaks what we cannot utter or when we don't know what to say. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. But the grumbling, now think about this, come on back, but the grumbling of the hopeless soul is vented in anger against God. But now let me quickly add, believers can get mad at or disappointed with God and at times envy unbelievers. Read Psalm 73. However, faith and hope asserts that unbelievers gain nothing from rejecting God's tolerance and believers lose nothing by having the promise paid by not having, let me say it this way, by not having our promise paid immediately. Romans 2, 7 says, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. So it is one thing to do well, but it is another to continue and to be patient while God delays. James 5, 7 through 8 says, Be patient, brethren, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, the duty The believer's duty, I'll say it that way, is to wait for God as long as one must 
while not yielding to temptation. Think about that. We're not to yield. We're to, we're to, what is our game plan that we learned about in Romans 6, 11? We are to We are to count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Come on here. The helmet of salvation is God's promissory note, the promised redemption and reconciliation through the gospel of Christ for original sin. Believing God through the gospel now covers every sin that we can commit, past, present, and future. However, there is one sin that the gospel does not cover, and that's blasphemy against the blaspheming the Holy Spirit, whether it is a willful ignorance or a deliberate rebellion against God's truth. If you reject the gospel, there is the, the, the gospel doesn't cover you, doesn't cover that sin. The helmet of salvation, though, reminds the believing sinner. Why? Because we do fail that because of our in Christ relationship, he or she cannot commit the unpardonable sin. When you accepted Christ as Savior, you could you no longer are able to commit the unpardonable sin no matter what. Because why? Romans 8, 1 through 2 informs the believing sinner that even though, even though we regularly fail, we cannot be condemned. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from Christ, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 35, 37 through 39 also informs the believing sinner that there can be no separation. You can't be, there's no condemnation and no separation. And it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, is the capstone scripture that supports the doctrine of eternal security. Now, I did a sermon on eternal security, so please go and, and look that up in my website. And it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. All right. <clears throat> the helmet of salvation now, coupled with godly sorrow, are the moral medicine for the guilt and shame to clear and cleanse the conscience for the daily wear and tear of convicted, tortured, and troubled souls who are repentant for the transgressions and tra trespasses of cold love, double-mindedness, doubt, hypocrisy, judging, and unfaithfulness that tarnish the reputation of God. Persons like this have lost, ignore, or deny their need for God and have temporarily turned to other counterfeit gods, which is idolatry. Come on here. Guilt and shame inherited at conception torments all humanity. We all have this problem. All are sinners by nature and by choice. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them 
at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest of humankind, we were by nature objects of wrath. Now think about this. No one was born saved. Children born and raised in a Christian home are no more saved than children born and raised in heathen, pagan, or unbelieving homes. Every person must hear and accept or reject the gospel for themselves. However, forgiven, believing sinners still experience guilt and shame because the enemy accurately, legitimately, and rightly accuses them before God and one's conscience also rightly condemns them because the ones because one's sinful carnal corrupted nature has not been eradicated or fully mortified again we sin by thought word and deed every day after we have been saved the helmet of salvation then is the therapy of comfort for moral spiritual injury of a crushed wounded spirit. Psalm 103, 13 through 14 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. So, because God made and knows humankind, God is the only one who can provide the comfort needed to overcome our present suffering. 2 Corinthians 3, 3 through 1, 3 through 7 says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we received. We have, we have ourselves received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ, our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, you also share in our comfort. Think about this. There is no secular psychological therapy or counseling technique that addresses the moral injury of a wounded spirit. Only the grace, mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation, and peace with and of God represented in the helmet of salvation can calm and restore tortured and troubled souls. All right. We are stopping here. The helmet of salvation is the piece of the armor God uses to instill assurance and confidence that God's promise of salvation and inheritance will happen. May God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.